please turn in your Bibles today to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Today when I read, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. Now, I know some of you are shocked. I normally have you turn to two passages, sometimes even three, but today it's just the one, and that's because today we're only going to preach half of a message. I'm going to give you the first half today, and then you're going to have to come back next week to get the rest. Today is a special day. Today is Father's Day. And normally on Father's Day, ministers will preach a message specifically to the dads. And they'll hope that everyone else who's present can, can take away something, grasp something from the Word, can, can get something from that. Or, or maybe they'll preach a message on honoring our fathers in spite of their many faults. Looking back over the past several years of, of my notes, I've preached messages on Father's Day called Man Up, Real Men, A Bad Dad, and then one called Homeschool. But today, we're actually right in the middle of a sermon series, and I'm having so much fun with this series that I don't want to break out of it. I don't want to put the series down and preach a Father's Day message and then come back next week and have to pick it back up. So rather than break out of the series for a week, we're just going to keep on going, if that's all right with you. Today, we're continuing our series called The Heart of a Leader. Now listen, for those who may be disappointed that we're not preaching a special Father's Day message, I do have some good news for you. Fathers are supposed to be leaders. I'm going to say that again in case anyone missed it. Fathers are supposed to be leaders. And as such, all of the messages in our Heart of a Leader series are great Father's Day messages. But today, I'm actually going to go a little bit further, and I'm going to preach a message from Heart of a Leader that is good for every father to hear. See, in week one, we talked about wisdom. Remember that? We talked about Solomon. Week number two, we talked about Joshua, and we discussed how to lead with courage. Well, today on Father's Day, we're going to talk about leading with patience. Everybody say patience. You were supposed to pick up right there. That's all right. Well, I didn't whistle it very well, Randy. My mouth's a little dry. In case you couldn't tell, that was a bar from the song Patience. Written by the great prophet Axel Rose. The Oxford Dictionary defines patience as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. If you believe that a dad needs patience, let me hear you say amen. amen. Let me tell you something. Anyone who doesn't think that patience is important for fathers has never assembled a swing set, a bookshelf, a bed, a Barbie house, or any Fisher Price toy. They've also never taken their kid to the hospital to have a dime, a Lego, a peanut, or a washer removed from their nose, their ear, or another orifice. And they've probably never paid to have a dent removed from their car to rebuild a mailbox, Justin, to repair a garage door opener, Justin, or to replace a cell phone thanks to the actions of their children. And they certainly haven't spent countless hours searching for the elusive pocketed red folder with brads that is on the supply list every year. In short, if someone tells you that fathers don't need patience, they are most assuredly not a father. So today on the holiest of all days, set apart to honor those amongst us who have the highest calling to be a dad. 
we're going to talk about leading with patience. And to do that, we're going to look at the life of a man who was both a father and a very influential leader. We're going to look at the life of Moses. As we look this week and next over or at a few stories from the life of Moses, there are three areas that I want to show you where a leader needs to have patience. But again, today we're just going to look at one of those areas, and we'll save the others for next week. To be able to find the first area where leaders need to have patience, we're going to look at a story that's found in Exodus chapter 17. Now, by the time we get to Exodus 17, Moses has already met the Lord in the form of a burning bush, He's already confronted Pharaoh, and he's already led the Israelite people out of Egyptian captivity. He's seen God work many miracles, including the parting of the Red Sea and providing food in the form of quail every evening and manna every morning. He's leading this massive group of people on their way to the promised land. And just two chapters before our story, Moses joined with the Israelites as they sang together, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Times have been good, amen? Amen. But now in Exodus chapter 17, the Bible tells us that the people find themselves in an area called Rephidim, where there was no water for them to drink. And that's where I want us to pick up our story in Exodus chapter 17, starting with verse number two. It says, so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Verse number five, the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Church, this morning, the first thing that I want you to know is that as a leader, you must have patience with the people you're leading. Listen, I want to tell you something. God knew what he was doing when he chose Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, didn't he? Because if he had chosen someone with less patience than Moses had, there might not have been anyone left to enter the promised land. I can guarantee you that if it were me, I would have left left every one of them suckers in the desert of sin. Now, I know this is God's chosen people we're talking about. I understand that. But I'm not kidding when I say they were just about the biggest bunch of babies you could imagine. These people had been enslaved by the Egyptians. They had been forced into hard labor, and they had been treated terribly. They had lived through a time where Pharaoh actually made a command that any male that was born to them had to be thrown into the Nile River immediately. Then they'd watched as God sent one plague after the next on the Egyptian people to convince them to let the Israelites go. They had seen as he parted the Red Sea to allow them to walk through And then as he took out Pharaoh's army that was chasing them, he had seen the Lord provide food, excuse me, they had seen the Lord provide food for them in the middle of the desert. And then here they are whining and complaining that there's no water. 
don't you think that a reasonable person would have thought about things for a minute and thought that maybe God had a plan? See, the thing is, these people weren't reasonable, were they? They were just like hundreds of other people who I've come into contact with over the years who praise God when things are good and then grumble at him when they're not. Exodus 17.3 says they grumbled against Moses saying, why did you bring us here to die? And listen, this wouldn't be the first time or the last time that the Israelites would say the same exact thing. In Exodus chapter 15, they were in another area that had water, but the water was bitter. So they came to Moses. And in verse 24 of Exodus 15, it says, so the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? In Exodus chapter 16, they were in the desert of sin, and there was no food. And verses 2 and 3 say, in the desert, the whole community did what? Grumbled. The whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Last week we read from Numbers chapter 14 where the spies returned from Canaan with a report about that land. You remember what happened in verses 2 through 4? Even if you weren't here, you probably already know. It says, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Over and over and over again, these people have seen God do great things. They have sung his praises, and then they come against something that they don't like, and they begin to grumble. They grumble against Moses. They grumble against Aaron, and they grumble against the Lord. You know, it would be easy to read the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And to make the determination in your mind that the Israelites are the most pessimistic, petty, and ungrateful people that ever lived. But can I tell you how I would define them? Here's how I would define the Israelites. Normal. They're just normal people. They're just people whose lives are filled with frustration and fear, sometimes rational and sometimes not. And do you know what normal people do when they are frustrated and scared? They grumble. Now, listen, I'm not saying it's good to be normal. Let me be clear about that for a second. But one thing that I have certainly learned in my 20-plus years of ministry, I started when I was four, as well as in, in leadership in the workplace, something that I have learned is that people love to grumble. And if you're going to be a good leader, you have to have the patience to see it happen, to try to understand it, to accept it, in some cases, to deal with it and to keep moving forward. You can't let it derail you. And honestly, the truth is that as a leader, you should want to hear people's complaints. Pastor, what are you talking about? That sounds stupid. Why would I want people to complain? Here's why you should want to hear people's complaints as a leader, because if you never hear complaints about the decisions that you have made or the actions that you have taken, then that probably means that the people you're leading don't trust you enough to tell you the truth. 
think about it. What's more likely? Let, let's just play, you know, imagine time for a minute. Do you think it's more likely that everyone in your circle of influence loves every decision you've ever made? Or, or, or perhaps that they've matured to the point where they are the only collective of people on the planet that has suddenly decided not to grumble when they're unhappy? Or do you think they are complaining, just not to you? So when you hear complaints from the people that you're leading, when you hear the grumbling, when you hear the moaning, when you hear the complaining, you have a few options available to you. First of all, you can ignore it and hope that it goes away without causing a bigger mess, which rarely works. You can get angry with the people that you're leading and make sure that they know about it. That doesn't usually go over too well. Or you can be a good leader. And you can patiently deal with it. You guys are awfully quiet today. I'm talking about leading with patience. If you read the entire story of Moses leading the Israelites, you'll see that there are three steps that Moses took almost every time that he found himself in a situation where the people he was leading were lashing out due to fear and frustration. These steps are the same steps that we need to take as we lead people at work, in church, in our friend groups, in, in our families, in organizations that we're a part of, and wherever else we find ourselves leading. Because again, remind, I want to remind you that I taught you in the very first lesson in the series that everyone is a leader. So as we lead with patience, we need to take these three steps. The first and most crucial step is to seek guidance from the Lord. M.C. Hammer said it best when he said, you've got to pray. Every time that Moses found himself standing in front of the nation of Israel, as they grumbled against him and the Lord, he turned his face to God. In Exodus chapter 15, 24, we read where it said the people grumbled, saying, what will we drink? Well, in verse 25, it says Moses cried out to the Lord. In Exodus 16, 2 and 3, when the people complained that there was no food, verse 4, Moses had a conversation with the Lord. And here in our text, in verse 2, it says that the people quarreled with Moses about the lack of water. And in verse 4, it says, then Moses cried out to the Lord. What am I to do with these people? Again, it happens in Numbers 14 that we read last week. And again in Numbers 16, the people grumbled and Moses prayed. Through prayer, Moses found strength, patience, and clarity of mind amidst the challenges. As leaders, we need to do the same thing that Moses did. We need to take our concerns and our frustrations to God. And in doing so, we will find that God gives us clarity to understand what's really happening. He will give us wisdom to know how to move forward, and he will give us the patience not to strangle the people who alerted us that there was a problem. Step number one is to pray. Step number two is to have an open and honest conversation. In our text, it says that the people grumbled against Moses, and Moses immediately asked them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? In other words, he said, guys, what's the problem? Like, like what's wrong? Why are you yelling at me? I can't count the number of times I've said that to Christina. Why are you yelling at me? Let me tell you something. We can learn a lot about what Mo, a lot by what Moses said, but we can learn a lot more by what he didn't say. 
Did you notice Moses, Moses didn't say, shut up? You notice, you notice that he didn't say, go away? Do you notice that, that Moses didn't say, no, you're wrong? Those are things that are easy to say when somebody grumbles, aren't they? Somebody starts complaining. It's the first thing you want to do. All three of them, shut up, go away, you're wrong. You can even mix up the order if you want. You're wrong, shut up, go away. Flows off the tongue. Moses didn't say that. In fact, he didn't make any statement at all. Instead, he asked a question. Moses said, why are you grumbling at me? Why are you quarreling with me? Why are you fighting with me? Why are you complaining about me? What seems to be the problem? You see, he asked a question that required the grumblers, first, to evaluate their own actions, and second, to explain clearly why they were frustrated and scared. There's another thing that Moses didn't say. Moses didn't say nothing. Pastor, that's a double negative. Yeah, I know. Moses didn't say nothing. In other words, he said something. He had a conversation. You see, too often we see leaders who lack the courage, like we talked about last week, who lacked the courage to even have a conversation in a situation like this. They choose to ignore the concerns of the people that they're leading. Or sometimes they choose just to give in and give the people what they want, even if it's not the best thing for the group. They'll do anything to just make the grumbling go away and not have to deal with it. As a leader, we need to be brave enough to sit down with our critics and ask them, what's the problem? What's the problem? There's a TV show that I like to watch. It's about a, a medical director in a hospital in a big city. And he always, in, in almost every conversation he has, he asks the people a question. Does anybody know what it is? There you go. How can I help? How can I? They'll come to him grumbling, complaining about a decision he's made or about something they're facing, and he'll say, how can I help? That's what a leader needs to do. That's the heart that a leader needs to have. And then, after we ask that question, we need to be strong enough to listen. Everybody say listen. And try to understand. Leading with patience requires a dedication to effective communication. Step number one is pray. Step number two is to have an open and honest conversation. And the last step is, if necessary, take action. If necessary, take action. Do something. Now listen to me. I want you to understand something, leaders. Sometimes people are going to complain just to complain. It's going to happen. Now, listen, don't be nudging the person next to you. Sometimes people are going to complain because they don't have anything to complain about. But you need to remember as a leader that most complaints, most grumbling comes from a place of frustration and fear. Now, listen, the Israelites went there way too often. I think we can all agree on that. We can all agree that the Israelites, man, their first thing was say, well, let's just go back to Egypt where we were slaves. But that doesn't change the fact that they had real fear and real frustration, whether it was founded or not, whether it was reasonable and logical or not. It was probably irrational considering the fact that God had led them this far and he wasn't going to lead them there just to, to die of thirst. So it was irrational, but that doesn't change the fact that their fear and frustration was real. 
They felt it. See, that's some, one of the things that we forget as a leader sometimes is the people that were, are following us, the people that we're trying to lead who are grumbling and complaining about the decisions we've made, they're doing it because they're scared and they're frustrated and they don't know what else to do. And their feelings are real to them. situation in which Moses found himself, it would have been wrong for him to just pray about it and then to have a conversation and listen to them and ignore it and just keep going down the road. That's not what a good leader does. Moses was required to take action. Many times in my life I've found that when people were grumbling about something that I'd done or said that I had to take action to either undo it or change it or fix it or at least make it a little bit more palatable. As leaders, we have to be willing to take decisive action when a situation comes forward. Even if it means admitting that we are Well, how do we find out what that action is, Pastor? You, you know, I, I, I did this and it didn't work out, so what do I do now? Let me tell you, you usually find out what that action is back in step number one when you pray. When you pray about it, like you shouldn't have done in the first place. When you pray about it and the Lord says, go here and do this. The Lord told Moses, go get your staff. The one that you hit the Red Sea with. The one that made the waters part. Apparently this is the staff of water. He says, go get your staff and hit that big rock. Moses struck the rock and it says water began to gush out enough for the Israelites to drink their fill. We're talking about leading nations. Let me tell you something. Leading people is not easy. I would rather do any other thing in the world. I'd rather dig a ditch in Arkansas Especially when they don't agree with our decisions and our course of action, which can lead to them grumbling and complaining. When this happens, it's awfully easy for us to to get angry, to get combative, or to shut down. with the people that we're leading, being transparent and addressing their concerns as well as sharing your motivations. And finally, if necessary, we should be prepared to take action based upon the wisdom that the Lord gives us in the best interest of the world.
Two questions for you today. The first is this. There's a chance that you're here and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior. You've never made the decision to give him your life. Or maybe you did, but then you made the decision to take it back. We won't get into the theology of that statement this morning, but if you're here today and you are not sure say, Pastor, I want to give my life to the Lord. I want him to forgive me of my sins and bring me into the family of God. If that's you, lift your hand up. We'll get to the second question in a minute, but before we do, I want to say a prayer, and I'm going to ask everyone in the room to repeat after me. So, Pastor, why do I need to say the prayer? You need to say it so that nobody else say this prayer and you mean it deep inside your heart, then that changes your entire world. Everything you've ever done will be forgiven in a moment. And you'll be just as much a Christian as anyone else in this world. Let's pray, say, Dear Father, forgive me of my sins. gift that you offer through your son, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take just a moment and applaud what the Lord just did. still bowed, every eye still closed, I have another question, and it's this. You say, Pastor, I am a leader who struggles with not having patience with the people that I lead. I need God to help me to be patient. I need him to help me remember that when people grumble and complain, that they're doing so out of fear and frustration. I need him to help me remember that when this happens, I need to turn to him. I need him to give me the strength to have open, honest, and transparent conversations and the boldness to take action, even if it means going back on what I said was the right thing. If that's you, you're here today, you say, Pastor, I just need God to help me have patience. I need him to help me be a better leader. I want you to lift up your hand right where you're at. Lord, you see the hands all across the room. God, I am so thankful for this series. Lord, I'm thankful for the things that you're teaching me every week as I study and that you're teaching us as a group as we study your word together and as we look at the lives of the men and women who you chose to lead. Lord, Moses is such a good example of patience. Thank you for this word today. I pray for every person that's lifted their hand and said, I need God to help me be a more patient leader. Lord, I pray that you'll do that right now. And God, I pray that as we go forward this week and next and into the coming weeks and months, as we are presented with opportunities in our leadership, to put this into action. That you will bring this into our remembrance. You will remind us of your word, of the example that was set. 